Last week, I used the word scandal to, to describe the fact that we're not being presented uh, during lockdown with data around the ill effects of lockdown, just the daily dose of death around COVID. And uh, one or two of you said to me, well, could you sort of explain that a bit more? Um, because that seemed like a strong accusation. So I want to talk today about the way Jesus valued human beings and explain a little bit more uh, uh, about how it seems to me uh, unconscionable that we haven't had that data and information about the pain of lockdown in far, far, far greater amounts. It plays into what is a human being? What are we made up of, body, mind and spirit? and the way that Jesus deals with people uh, as a total person, not simply a soul with ears, doesn't really just address their spiritual needs, but the totality of their human experience. And we'll use this passage in Mark's Gospel to reflect on this wider question of what is a human, made in the image of God, created by him, as the Bible says, a little lower than the angels, is this glorious human person, a man and a woman, humanity. Uh, how does that play into this whole way we're dealing with uh, this pandemic of COVID-19? Well, here's the passage, and it's in Mark chapter 2. Very well-known story of Jesus uh, healing a man who's let down through a roof of a flat roof house in first century Israel. Uh, four friends bring him and lower him down because they're desperate for him to meet Jesus. They've heard so much about this Jesus, the rabbi, who does amazing stuff, not like any ordinary rabbi. And they're absolutely insistent that the crowd of Pharisees and scribes and others uh, won't block their access for their friend, who they're going to get to Jesus by hook or crook, one way or another, even if it means climbing on a roof. Can you imagine that? Carrying him up there, digging a great hole in it and letting him down through the roof with the, these posh Pharisees and scribes looking up as sort of uh, dust and debris falls on their head. What a surprise to have a man lowered through the roof. Well, so this is what happens when he's lowered down in Mark chapter 2. After uh, digging through it, the roof, uh, they lowered the mat with the paralysed man lying on it. Then verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, nice warm term of affection, your sins are forgiven. Now, some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier? And then he asked them a question. Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. But, verse 10 says, in order that you can know that the Son of Man, I mean, you can know I've got the authority to forgive sins, he then turns to the paralysed man and says to him, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. And so he heals him. He got up took his mat and walked out in full view of them all. Now, that's quite an important verse in this passage. It means that this wasn't done in secret. It's not a pretend miracle. It's not something loads of people couldn't authenticate as accurate and true in the presence of all of them. Can you imagine the crowd? He stands up off the mat, paralysed no longer, pushes his way through all these religious leaders and others and walks out the door. No wonder, they say, we have never seen anything like this. So, what's this story all about? Well, it, it's about Jesus looking at a human being in distress and dealing with his spiritual desperation, his need for forgiveness, forgiving him, Jesus as the Son of God and Son of Man, forgiving him, and then healing him. So it's as if Jesus sees this man through the lens of his total person. He deals with the spiritual side of his life, sins forgiven, and the physical brokenness, which he obviously has, as a paralytic. 
Now just hold that thought in your mind, because I want to come back to this passage in a minute and talk about the miracles of Jesus generally, of which this is an illustration. And it's something we often miss when we see the miracles, because it's easy, naively, to believe that Jesus is just healing someone with leprosy or a crippled person or a paralysed person or opening the eyes of a blind person. There seem to be lots of physicality about Jesus' miracles. And I want to talk about the broader issue of Jesus recognising the totality of what it means to be a human. So let's think about what I said last week about the scandal of the absence of data on lockdown. Uh, see, there are two reasons why this is a scandal. Firstly, uh, no public health intervention should ever take place without understanding the consequences of it. We could do this, but if we do, what will be the unintended consequences of that? The contraindications, the, the thing that tells us, well, it might be the right thing, but we'd better be careful because doing it will create these problems. And that happens with medical intervention all the time. It's happened with the vaccines. One of the amazingly brilliant things that have happened about the vaccine that the government and scientists and others have done so superbly is to create some vaccines very quickly, breathtakingly quickly, and to do so with very, very limited contraindications, negative effects. The side effects of having the vaccine might be a sore arm or a little bit of flu-like symptoms for 24 hours, but in general, the consequences, the negative consequences, are very modest. And so the vaccine was approved because the negative consequences are modest. Now, lockdown, you'd think, as a massive intervention, uh, would have been thoroughly examined in the same way. So yes, we might think if we lock people down, we'll stop the spread of the virus, okay. But what are the consequences of doing that? What are the negative side effects? Um, no medical intervention should take place without clearly understanding what the downside is. Uh, and the fact that we don't seem to be presented with that seems to me to be a medical and scientific failure. No vaccine, believe me, none of the vaccines would have been approved if they've had anything like the side effects that lockdown has. People would simply say, that's too much. Uh, the cure's worse than the, worse than the disease. And the second thing is this, let me just uh, help us understand how government actually works. Some years ago, when Gordon Brown was the Prime Minister here in the UK, he called a general election. David Cameron was the leader of the Conservative Party, Nick Clegg the leader of the Liberal a Democrat Party, and pretty much everybody in the country thought, this is going to be very, very close. So as a result, our, our really excellent civil service gamed, thought about, dreamed about what scenarios may happen. They came up with it. I think about half a dozen potential scenarios. How will we as a civil service cope with the result of the election? What if there's a minority government or uh, no overall control? Or uh, let's be clear that whatever happens, we've thought about the consequences and, and they did. Uh, and to some extent, uh, the coalition government was well served from the beginning because civil servants are prepared for that amongst other eventualities. In 2016, when David Cameron called the referendum on our presence in the European Union, the civil service wanted to uh, think about and prepare for a no vote in case that happened so that the consequences could be prepared for in advance and we could be ready. And the government, uh, for political reasons, said, "I don't. we don't want you to prepare for that because if it gets out that you're preparing for a no vote, it will undermine our commitment to a yes vote. So no, don't prepare for that. Now that was an an interesting political thing, probably wise politically, because if people had heard that, they would have been suspicious of the government. They think, well, they're not very confident. From a political point of view, that was a really good decision. Don't prepare for a no vote. Uh, but from a practical point of view, when there was a no vote, it meant that we were right behind the power curve in getting ready to know the implications uh, of that. So it's impossible to believe that a year ago, when lockdown was introduced as the measure, but the civil service didn't say, well, let's game, let's plan, let's work out the scenarios. What are going to be the implications of this? 
It's impossible to believe. So if they didn't do it, it's an act of grotesque negligence. Never before has a whole country of perfectly healthy people being quarantined for the sake of a few vulnerable and uh, a horrible virus, which, which clearly came. So surely the consequences would have to be thought through. That's responsible government. Now, it either didn't happen, which means it's grotesquely irresponsible, or it did happen, and we're just not being told, in which case it's manipulative. Hard to see quite what else is going on. Uh, and I see this is very important because we're not just virus carriers or virus sufferers. We're whole human beings. So it absolutely matters, not whether there's a surge or not, or whether kids are going back to school is going to create more cases. It may well. But what about the totality of the human condition? Surely we ought to be faced with the data on that all the time. And I've banged on about this uh, for months and months now, what's the data on additional suicides, pain in the home, mental health, uh, operations that are not taking place, undiagnosed cancers, undiagnosed heart conditions, on and on and on and on. So you might say to yourself, well, yeah, but what's this got to do with Mark II? Mark II is a remarkable story because, like many of the miracles, it sees Jesus deal with not just a broken human in front of him, or the spiritual life of the human being. Actually, this is often misunderstood. The miracle that Jesus brings here throughout the New Testament, and even say with Peter and John, with the, the person at the gate, beautiful, who's crippled, and, and Peter says, well, silver and gold I don't have, but what I do have, get up and walk. Now, the irony is of that situation, that because the crippled man in Acts was set free, walking, leaping, praising God, many of you have read the story, he would have been able to be a productive member of society from that point onward. No need to beg. He could have worked for a living. He could have earned money. So actually, Peter and John did give him silver and gold because they gave him, in his physical healing, the capacity to be economically self-sufficient instead of looking for handouts. So what Jesus did in Mark 2 is a remarkable, holistic miracle. The man's spiritual life is dealt with by Jesus. Sins are forgiven. The man's broken physical condition is healed by Jesus. But just think about the totality of that man's life. He's healed socially. He can walk out of there, walk into other people's homes, mix with other people in a way he's never been able to do before. As a social being, he has been restored. He can take his place in the economic structure of the first century. He can now earn a living, support himself financially, pay taxes, be a productive member of society. And so when Jesus heals this man in Mark 2, it's a physical miracle, a spiritual miracle, an economic miracle, a social miracle. It's the whole person miracle that Jesus makes possible. Because he sees the man not through the lens of a spiritually broken person alone or a physically broken person. He sees him through the lens of his whole being. And that's really my great sadness about the lockdown process that it says continually that all that really matters now is the virus and it's simply not true we have to deal with this really horrible virus and we also have to deal with all these other things and if we're not presented with the data the british public will continue to be focused and the global public on the virus to the exclusion of the grotesque death pain, horror, that around the globe is already unfolding by way of starvation and untreated other diseases. And even in the West, who knows the massive long-term effects? And we don't know because we're just simply not being presented with the modelling or the data about this. So today we can get excited about what Jesus thinks about humanity. And what the church should be doing as we emerge ever so slowly out of lockdown in the West is being those who look at people as Jesus looks at them and sees them with all their various needs, 
mental, emotional, psychological, spiritual, physical, economic, and etc., social, and reaches out with the good news of the gospel to meet the needs of a glorious created humanity in whom the image of God resides. So this week, look at human beings through the eyes of Jesus and see them, not simply fearful about a one medical condition, but see them as those who need to flourish in their lives. Encourage an older person who's been locked up for a year and is terrified that they're never going to see their grandchildren before they die. Look for people who have need this week and be an agent, an ambassador of grace, forgiveness, wholeness. Bring into people's lives everybody you can, every neighbour that you can possibly meet even a a conversation in a supermarket, look out for people in the queue in front of you or behind you who are looking a bit weary behind their mask. Help them. This week, think about the Jesus way, which is to think of a whole person with holistic needs and to reach out to them. Because we've been forgiven, we've been set free. We are the people of the light. May God help us bring that light and that glorious healing into those who frankly are still struggling enormously with all this current restriction. So God bless you this week as you think about the miracles of Jesus and you think about being a a conduit and an agent of that loving care for this whole human being. And thank God for what Jesus did to the paralytic through the roof and ask God to make you that sort of caring for the whole person agent of goodness this week. God bless you.